In the first reading today, St. Paul tells us that all creation is in travail. And he says, even we ourselves are in the same situation, even though we have the Spirit as the first fruits. We ask ourselves, okay, why? What is going on and why is this happening? St. Paul even says that creation isn't in travail of its own accord, but by him who subjected it that way. So right from the beginning, the way that God created things, all of creation was going to be in travail. Now, normally when we talk about travail, it's oftentimes about a woman giving birth. And so we look at what's going on and we recognize that that's exactly what we're moving toward. That's why St. Paul talks about how creation is waiting for the revelation of the children of God. Now, what's interesting in this is that St. Paul tells us that we also are awaiting that revelation. It's like, but we're already the children of God. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for that ultimate rebirth, which is heaven. That's why he talks about the redemption of our bodies. So our body being part of the material creation, there's going to be suffering. That's part and parcel of life. And it's most importantly, part and parcel of Christian life. The fact that we become members of Jesus Christ does not mean that we don't suffer anymore. Obviously, we all know that. But it's a question of being able to recognize it in a new way, to be able to see it from a spiritual perspective, to be able to unite our suffering with the suffering of Christ. We look in the Gospel reading and we see St. Peter recognizing his own sinfulness and saying, leave me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. But instead, our Lord turns it the other way. And isn't it interesting that one sentence later, the man who's asking Jesus to leave him because he's a sinner, we are told leaves everything behind to follow Jesus. And so, again, you see how our Lord just turns everything the other way. And he tells Peter not to be afraid, which again is an interesting statement. All of this because of some fish. Think about it. They catch these fish, they fill up two boats to the point that they're sinking, and Peter says, leave me for I'm a sinful man. It's like, what? What's that have to do with catching fish? has to do with what Jesus was preaching right before they caught the fish. We don't know what he said because we're not told exactly what he said, but that he was preaching the Word of God. And if he was preaching the Word of God, then he was calling people to conversion. He was calling the people to truly live their lives for the Lord. And that's why St. Peter, recognizing his own sinfulness, is saying, I'm not worthy. But our Lord tells him not to be afraid because the very purpose of our Lord's coming is the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. So if we are truly seeking union with Christ, we don't need to be afraid. We need to convert. We, need to, we can't say, well, because I believe in Jesus, I can keep sinning and it's no big deal because after all, he came to forgive my sins, so I'll give him something to forgive. No. If we truly believe in the Lord, if we are going to live our lives for him, we need to strive to get rid of sin. That is what creation is looking for in the revelation of the children of God. The world needs saints. The world has always needed saints, but the world needs saints more now than ever before. And that's that initial revelation to all of creation. And so it is our conversion to Christ and our living that holy life. Then St. Paul says we ourselves await the fullness of that revelation, which is only going to happen in the resurrection of our bodies. When our bodies go to heaven and they should, assuming that we get there, but assuming that we do, our bodies rise from the dead, we go to heaven, there our body is reunited with our glorified soul, 
and in the fullness then of our humanity, we will be glorifying God for the rest of eternity. That is the revelation that will be given to you and me. In the meantime, the revelation of the truth and the revelation of the love of God has already been given to us. And now, just like with St. Peter, what Jesus said to him, from now on you'll be catching men rather than catching fish, now that's our task, to be able to bring that truth and to bring that charity out into the world to reveal to creation which is suffering. Why is it suffering? Because it doesn't know God. And we do. And so our task then is to bring that truth and charity into a world that knows neither. And again, that's what we have to be able to, first of all, recognize. Been living a lie for years. It's all around us. People don't like to hear that, but it's the reality. We've been made for the truth. Jesus said the truth will set you free. St. Paul said that creation is going to be set free one day. The truth is going to be revealed in its fullness, but it has already been to you and me. We have the fullness of the truth. The question is, what are we doing with it? Do we want it, first of all? And what are we doing with it? Are we really bringing that truth as the children of God out into the world. Think about it. Jesus is the Son of God. He came into this world to be able to show us the truth. He came into this world to teach us how we are to live. Now you and I are sons and daughters of God, which means that we are to continue the work of our Lord. We are to live as He did. Obviously, we can't do it perfectly as he did because he is God. But he took on a human nature to show us through a created human body what it is to be able to live as sons and daughters of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. People came to Jesus because they saw the way that he lived, because they heard he spoke the truth, because they recognize and receive the love that he had, and that's exactly what he's asking of us. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be out preaching. It means simply that we have to live it. And that is 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. We have to be living the truth in charity. That is the Christian call, pure and simple. But that's not the way that things are in the world. Right now, sadly, it's not even the way things are in the church. And isn't it interesting? It almost seems schizophrenic, but it's not, obviously. But look at the, look at the collect, the, the, the prayer at the beginning of Mass. It prays that God will order the things of the world, and it prays that we will be able to have tranquil devotion in the church. Do we have either? The world is a disaster. And the church is anything but tranquil these days. And so we start out with that, and then we go right into a, to, the, to the reading, which talks about everybody being in travail and the suffering of the present, not to be compared to the glory that's to be revealed. So does this seem like a contradiction? On the surface, it might, yeah. But what we do want is for creation to be ordered according to God's will. And we want the church to be able to have tranquil devotion. But in the meantime, as St. Paul points out, we're in travail. And so we look at what was going on at the time of St. Paul. There was a transition that was happening. Transitions are always, always, always marked by chaos. And so you look at the chaos that was going on in the world at the time, you look at the chaos that was going on in Judaism, but also 
in the early church as they were being persecuted. Jerusalem was about to be destroyed by the Romans. There was a major change that was coming. So now we look at ourselves. It's a mess. The world is a mess, and sadly so is the church right now. Because there is a change coming. Because we are at the end of an era. Again, using the very term that St. Paul used in travail, we think of a woman who is in travail, and the most painful suffering that a human being can endure, but that's relatively short term. And from that she gains a baby. A human person who hopefully is going to live many years in this life, but has a soul that is immortal and is going to live forever and ever. So there is a short-term suffering, which is a very, very painful thing. It's not to try and downplay that, but that's why St. Paul is saying the suffering of the present is nothing compared to the glory that is going to be revealed. And I think most women would tell you the same thing. Yes, the suffering is terrible, but it's nothing compared to the glory because you've got this baby who's going to be living for many years to come. The glory is far greater than the suffering. That's what the church is going through right now. That's what the world is going through right now. We're at a transition. We're at the end of an era, and we're going to be going into something that is new and something that is beautiful. And we will have exactly what it is that we were praying for. Things are going to be ordered, and we will have tranquil devotion. Because in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, everything is going to be set right. But we have to get there. And that's where we're moving right now. That's the direction that we're going. And so we simply need to be able to look at what our response is in the midst of it. Remember, when St. Paul was writing his letter to the Romans, he was in prison. So again, this isn't somebody who is out enjoying things. He's in prison writing to these people. And he's talking to them about all of these different mysteries and parts of the faith. And this one that we hear today, St. Paul's looking at what's going on in his own life, as well as in the world and in the church. Yes, things were in chaos, but they were about to change. They were soon to change. And so, just a few years after he wrote that, Jerusalem was destroyed. The church continued to be persecuted until 313. You could say, oh my goodness, you know, we have 300 more years to go. No, we don't. In the world, things began about 300 years ago. Go back to the French Revolution. In the church, things began a long time ago. There are three groups that have infiltrated the church. One started hundreds of years ago, one started in 1924, one started shortly thereafter, around 1929, early 30s. And so we've been at this for a long time already, and it's coming to a head. And as that happens, we need to be very careful about what we're going to do, because it's going to be easy to run away. It's going to be easy to be able even to look at what we, what we heard in the gradual. And the pagans would say, where is your God? It's not pagans saying that anymore. It's Catholics saying that. Where is the Lord? When's he going to intervene? What's, where, where's God? Right here is where he is. All you have to do is look within your own self. You don't need to be looking out there. You need to just look within. If you're in the state of grace, God is within you. The question every one of us has to ask is, am I within God? If God is in me, am I in him? If I'm in him, I don't need to be panicking. I don't need to be worried. He's got it all under control. I sure don't, but he does. And if we can look at it that way, we can be at peace in the midst of it. Even though everything around us is a mess, we can still have the order of God. Even though everything within the church might be a mess right now, we can still have tranquil devotion. We can be at peace, even though things around us are not. 
That's what the Lord is giving us. And it is precisely that that is going to be the revelation of the children of God to the world. This is what the world needs. This is also what the church needs. Remember, it is in times like this that God raises up the greatest saints because it's what we need. If we just needed ordinary saints right now, that's what God would, or would raise up because everything is reasonably good. Things aren't reasonably good. We need extraordinary saints. And that's exactly what we're going to see. No, we haven't seen them yet. God is preparing them. And there is absolutely no reason in the world why you cannot be one of them. It's not look at everybody else. You need to look and ask the question, what does God want of me? God wants you to be a saint. And he wants you to be a great saint. And the wonderful thing about the mess that we're living in right now is that there has never been a better time to be a saint because all you need to really do is live your faith. Because it is so countercultural right now that it makes you look like a great saint just because you're being what used to be considered an ordinary Catholic. So you don't need to be doing extraordinary things. You don't need to walk on water. You don't need to work miracles. You don't need to do all kinds of things. You just need to live the faith. That means live the truth in charity. Both are necessary. We have to have the truth. We absolutely have to have the charity. They said the world knows neither of those. And right now, all you have to do is look at some places within the church, and you will see that they are rejecting the, church, the truth outright, trying to change the moral teachings of the church, trying to change even some of the doctrines of the church. They can't change. If something is dogmatically stated, that means it's infallible. It means it cannot change. It doesn't matter what the societal norms are. It doesn't matter that the world has changed and now says these things are okay. No, they're not. They cannot be. They never will be. The truth is the truth. But we need to have the truth with charity. We can't just beat people over the head with the truth. We need to bring it to people in love. It is the charity that the world needs to see, not the false charity. There's plenty of that that's out there. Oh, we just need to be accepting and so on. No, no, no. The truth with charity, both. Not one apart from the other. Both are necessary together. That is exactly the life of Jesus Christ. And therefore, that is the life of those who are the children of God. He is the Son of God. It is exactly the way he lived his life. We are the children of God, sons and daughters of God. It is how we are to live our lives. So it is a challenge for us. It is a great challenge. It would be a whole lot easier to be alive in a time when everything was smooth and easy and going along well. We're not. And rather than complaining about our situation, we need to rejoice in it. If God wanted you alive at a time when things were easy, he would have created you at a time when things were easy. He created you for now. He created you to be alive in this time, and he created you to be a saint in this time. And so if we can see that, and embrace it and recognize what the Lord is trying to do in our lives, to raise us up, to make us saints. And he's given us the most glorious opportunity to be able to do it because everything around us is going the other direction. So, like I said, it's the greatest opportunity in history. There has never been a better time or an easier time, if you look at it that way, to become a saint. But we have to make the choice. And that choice is ours. We can make the choice to be like the world. We can make the choice to try and be like those people that are trying to change the teachings of the church. Or we can be like the sons and daughters of God, meaning we can be like the Lord. The Lord is the truth. The Lord is love. 
and the Lord is going to be bringing about the fullness of the revelation, which is going to be life. That's what heaven is, fullness of life, of truth, and of love. That's our task. That's what we're created for. That is what the world needs. It is what the church needs right now. If we are willing to accept, if we are willing to seek the will of God, that's where he's going to lead us. And so it is a time for rejoicing, not a time to be upset, not a time to be sad because of all the things that are going on. Yeah, it's tragic, there's no doubt. But I suppose, again, if you go back, you know, Jesus talks about the woman who is about to give birth and says she's not happy when, her, when, the, when the pain comes. But at the same time, she knows what that means. The baby's coming. And so everybody can rejoice. Nobody's rejoicing because she's suffering. They're rejoicing because the baby is on the way. If we can look around, that's what we can see. And isn't that exactly what Jesus told us? He said, when you see these things happening, stand up, lift up your head because your redemption is at hand. So we don't need to be sad. We don't need to be saying, poor me. We don't need to be getting all upset about all these things. We simply need to do what we've been created to do, to be truly the sons and daughters of God, which means simply to live the truth in love.